the cloud, yes. Um, if somebody, Olga, are you there? Yes, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ilya Kapovich. <laughs> I'm going to talk about primitivity rent for random elements in free groups. All right, okay, thank you very much. Um, so this talk is based uh, on a, a recent paper which is available in archive, you know, so here is a reference and also it is to appear in the journal of, of group theory. Uh, I think that the title of the paper is, I haven't actually checked, but I think it may be precisely that or something close to the title of the talk. So. Uh, and so as the, uh, which is primitivity uh, rank for random elements in three groups. Uh, so the talk will be mainly about three groups, but uh, um, uh, actually the idea of the primitivity rank as it turns out makes sense for many other algebraic structures that admit uh, free objects and where all substructures or at least all finitely generated substructures are free. You know, so maybe I have time, I'll say something about that later, but our context will be that of group series. So um, uh, we work with a free group. Um, I mean, free groups, uh, they usually come with some sort of a preferred basis, at least that's how they're born. But I mean, they're also abstractly free groups uh, and an element W in such a group is called primitive if uh, it belongs to some free basis uh, of this group. So, of course, elements of the given basis, they are primitive, but there are many others, uh, you know, my, uh, because this is not a unique free basis for this group, uh, you know, so an, an element that belongs to some free basis is called primitive. And as I said, uh, the notion of primitivity uh, it, uh, exists in many other algebraic structures where free objects exist, so uh, whereas free modules, freely algebras, free associative algebras, uh, uh, um, free abelian groups, uh, and various other contexts. Uh, so uh, a couple, uh, maybe a few uh, quick examples. Uh, so if you have a free group on X1, XR, where R is at least two, uh, then an element X1, X2. So of course, as I said, uh, you know, the, the given letters, you know, X1, X2, XR, they're primitive, but so is the element X1, X2, you know, so it's also primitive uh, in this object. And more generally, if you multiply X2 by any word in the other generators, uh, X2 through XR, and this is also going to be primitive uh, in this free group. But if you take the commutator, uh, X1, X2, X1 inverse, X2, inverse, that's already uh, not primitive. And uh, seeing that this element is not primitive already requires some kind of an argument. Uh, so it's not entirely obvious. And there are arguments uh, uh, of two uh, substantively different kinds, uh, you know, one involved in abelianization and another involved in uh, sort of uh, more topological considerations or combinatorial considerations. Uh, but uh, as I said, an important fact about free groups, uh, uh, well, I stated it here, you know, for finally generated free groups, but it's actually true for any free group that uh, if you have uh, a free group on X1, XR, so uh, then every subgroup uh, H of this free group is itself free. You know, so, and as I said, you know, even though here this fact is stated for the case where the ambient group is finally generated, uh, uh, so this theorem is true for all free groups, including those uh, where the given basis is infinite. Uh, and uh, um, uh, let me make uh, 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 several remarks about this context, uh, uh, you know, and the statement also. Uh, um, so, uh, um, one fact which is uh, maybe not immediately obvious from, from the definition, if you think about how free groups are defined, uh, uh, is that uh, uh, the cardinality of the basis uh, of a free group is an invariant of the group itself. You know, so in particular for finitely generated free groups, if you have a group G which is isomorphic to a free group on X1, XR, and to a free group on X1, XM, then R have, has to be the same as M. And moreover, in this case, uh, uh, this number R, which is also M, is the so-called abstract rank of the group, which is the smallest cardinality of a generating set of this group. So for any group G, we can define the rank of R, which shall denote by R of G as the smallest uh, cardinality of a subset of G, which generates the group. And for the free group, uh, so uh, uh, this rank is always equal to the cardinality of, of any free basis of this group. In particular, that's uh, true for finitely generated uh, free groups. Uh, the rank of the finitely generated free group is equal to the number of elements in any free basis. 
Uh, and uh, um, as I said, you know, the notion of the rank actually makes sense for an arbitrary group if you think about the rank in terms of cardinality, but uh, if you want the rank to be a number, then this notion uh, makes sense for finitely generated groups, and that's going to be the context that uh, uh, we will concentrate on. So uh, if you remember your sort of elementary uh, group theory, so if you take the symmetric group Sn, uh, where n is at least three, uh, then uh, the rank of this group is actually equal to two. So it turns out that uh, the symmetric group can be generated by two permutations um, always. So if n is equal to one or two, the rank is smaller, it's equal to one, you know, but uh, uh, you know, that's not a very interesting case. So because uh, in that case, the symmetric group is cyclic, uh, but for uh, non-abelian symmetric groups, uh, uh, for finite symmetric groups, the rank is equal to two. And uh, linear algebra considerations uh, can be used to show that the rank of the free abelian group uh, uh, g to the n is actually equal to n. Uh, you know, so that's even that is not entirely obvious, but uh, you know, so you can do it uh, uh, by somewhat more elementary linear algebra considerations, and then we can apply directly to the free group context. So now let me uh, uh, formulate the main definition, which will be the subject of this talk, and then I'll discuss it a little bit. So uh, here we uh, use the ambient free group of finite rank R. You know, so it's a free group on X1, XR. So where R is at least two. I mean, technically speaking, the definition also makes sense for R equals one, but it's not an interesting case, so we'll not consider it. And suppose that W is a non-trivial element uh, in this group. So we'll define the primitivity rank of W, which is denoted by pi of W, uh, as the smallest rank uh, of a subgroup H of the ambient free group, which contains W and which contains W as a non-primitive element. So the smallest rank, uh, uh, remember subgroups of free groups of free, so uh, and even without that, we can still talk about the rank, you know, so it's the smallest rank of a subgroup of F, which contains W as a non-primitive element. That's assuming that at least one such subgroup exists and the primitivity rank is equal to infinity uh, if uh, no such H exists. So that's the official definition. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, one remark is that, uh, um, actually two remarks, uh, is that, uh, of course, if W is a non-trivial, non-primitive element uh, uh, in the ambient group, if it's already non-primitive in the ambient group FR, then for H in particular, we can take the ambient group FR, which shows that for non-primitive element in FR, the primitivity rank is always less than or equal than R. So it's finite and it's bounded by the rank of the ambient uh, group where everything yeah. happens. And a somewhat less uh, um, obvious argument, or actually there are several different arguments, but in particular I can prove it using stalling subgroup graphs, uh, shows that if we start with a primitive element in the free group, then the rank of primitivity rank is equal to infinity. So a primitive element in FR uh, remains primitive in every intermediate subgroup that contains it. You know, so that's also true. So there is this dichotomy, so the primitive Primitivity rank is primitive, uh, so is infinite if and only if the element W uh, was uh, uh, already primitive in the ambient group. And in the case where the, the, the primitivity uh, rank is finite, it's actually less than or equal than R. And uh, another uh, part of this definition is uh, the critical set, which is the set of subgroups uh, of uh, H of the ambient group, which contain W as a non-primitive element and whose rank realizes the primitivity rank uh, of W. Uh, so um, these are all subgroups of smallest possible rank, uh, uh, which contain W as a non-primitive element. Uh, uh, of course, if W was primitive, if the primitivity rank is uh, infinite, then this critical set is going to be empty. But in every other case, it's going to be some non-empty set uh, of subgroups. So uh, this uh, 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 that's the main definition for today. So I hope that people uh, 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 digest it. Uh, well, uh, this notion was introduced by Deron Puder uh, in a 2014 paper. I'll explain a little bit later the context that he was interested in and uh, when we talk about some applications. Um, uh, but uh, um, so this notion, even though it's uh, uh, fairly recent, uh, it turned out to be quite useful uh, uh, in several different contexts. It's a natural notion which has already found uh, uh, applications of 
sort of fairly different kinds. So I think that this is going to provide an important notion for the future in the theory of free groups. Uh, any questions about this definition before we proceed? Okay. So uh, uh, revisiting uh, our examples. So as I said, if we take, for instance, a free group on two generators uh, to, to, uh, A and B, then any primitive element, in particular the element A, has primitivity rank A equal to infinity. Uh, and uh, if we take the same ambient group uh, f of a b and we take that element w the commutator that we considered before uh, so uh, it turns out that in this case the primitivity rank is equal to two uh, i mean it's not obvious but it's not very hard to prove uh, you know so uh, and we can uh, the, the you know the ambient group itself uh, if you take it for h so it realizes this minimum uh, the, the smallest possible rank of a subgroup uh, that uh, contains W as a non-primitive element. Uh, so if we take the same element, uh, uh, the commutator of A and B in the free group on A, B, and C, the primitivity rank is still equal to two. And we can take for the uh, for a critical subgroup for an element of the critical set, uh, uh, the same group uh, F of A, B. In fact, uh, in this case, the critical set will just consist of that, uh, you know, but that already requires, uh, there's nothing else there, so it's uh, like a single element set, uh, the critical set, uh, but that already requires a more involved argument. So uh, all of these things that are written on this slide, I mean, they're relatively straightforward. And yet, you know, so if you think about the definitions, you should be able to prove it sort of by brute force uh, using not terribly difficult tools, but uh, just about everything else uh, about the primitivity rank already requires some work, you know, so apart from a few basic examples. Uh, so let me uh, uh, mention, you know, certain things that are known about the primitivity rank. Uh, 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 so um, it turns out to be uh, the primitivity rank and also the critical set, uh, I didn't write it here, they are algorithmically computable. So given uh, uh, there exists uh, an algorithm of, uh, such that if we're given a non-trivial element W in this free group on X1, XR, we can compute its primitivity rank and we can also compute the critical set. Uh, so this is um, a result of Puder uh, and uh, Prozanchevsky. But it turns out that the algorithm, uh, and I think this is the only algorithm that that exists, uh, and it's uh, uh, they don't uh, give any complexity estimates. And in fact, by looking at it, it's clear that that algorithm is at least. Uh, uh, I, I mean. The, the complexity is actually higher than exponential. So the, uh, the precise algorithm for computing the primitivity rank appears to be quite inefficient. Uh, maybe it's possible to improve it, but we don't, it's not clear for now how. So, uh, I mean, it involves enumerating uh, um, certain things, uh, uh, certain sets, you know, which grows uh, actually higher than exponential already. Uh, so, uh, uh, one of the reasons, uh, one of the main reasons people in geometric group theory are interested in this notion uh, is uh, uh, this result of Lauder and Wilton, uh, you know, so from a few years ago, unfortunately I didn't uh, write down the year here, which says that uh, if you take a free group Frank R with R at least three, and if you take an element W there uh, with uh, uh, primitivity rank greater than or equal than three, then this one relator group with its generators X1, XR, and the single relation W equal to one is coherent. Coherent. That is to say, all finitely generated subgroups in, in this group are finitely presentable. So that's a pretty strange and interesting result. Uh, so, and uh, in fact, in this work, there are connections of some sort with um, ideas coming from the Hanno Neumann conjecture. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, in the same paper, I believe, uh, uh, or maybe. Uh, well, I don't remember now, but it's the same paper where they proved that. I think it is. So in 2018, Lauder and Wilton, uh, they conjectured uh, that in this situation that these uh, uh, groups are in fact um, uh, hyperbolic. That is to say that if you take a, 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 a free group of rank at least three, and we take an element there uh, with primitivity rank at least three, an element which is not a proper power, uh, uh, then uh, the one related group with this element W as the defining relation is what hyperbolic. Uh, 
Uh, so th those of you who remember something about the uh, Newman spelling theorem know that if the element is a proper power, then this one related group is always hyperbolic. So this conjecture is only sort of, uh, this assumption here is for that reason, because uh, if the element is a proper power, uh, you know, then this, conjecture, this conclusion is known for uh, very different reasons. And what they observed uh, in terms of justifying this conjecture, they actually proved that under this assumption that the primitivity rank is at least three, uh, this one related group has no bump like solitary subgroups of any kind, which is the standard abstraction to hyperbolicity everywhere in particular, uh, in particular uh, in the world of one related groups. Uh, and uh, um, also uh, uh, later on, Cashin and Hoffman uh, produced uh, an experiment, a uh, computer edit proof where they verified this conjecture for um, of a fairly large uh, collection of uh, uh, one, one related groups of this kind. They verified that the conjecture holds for all W of lengths less than or equal than 17, where uh, the rank R of the M band group is at, uh, is at most four. Uh, so, so Louder and Wilton proved that it has no Baumsog solitaire subgroup. Correct. Right? Yeah. And actually, oh. if you think about it, I mean, that's sort of not terribly difficult. Uh, uh, but I mean, they, they did prove it. So th this is, a, yeah, uh, this is a result. And this is a property that is known for these groups. And you can think about this property as sort of, in some sense, maybe the original motivation for this conjecture. Uh -huh. okay. uh, because as I said, the absence of Baumsog solitaire uh, uh, groups uh, or the I don't know. The presence of Baumstack solitaire uh, uh, subgroups is the standard abstraction to hyperbolicity. And for one later groups, uh, sort of it's conjecturally the only abstraction oh. to hyperbolicity. Uh, so, uh, um, oh, so, uh, so that conjecture would improve, would imply there. Uh, uh, yeah, but. Uh, 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 as I said, proving that every one related group is out of bounds like solitary subgroups is hyperbolic is probably very difficult. In fact, it's known to be very difficult in some sense. Uh, you know, so proving this conjecture may be more tractable, who knows, but even this conjecture appears um, complicated. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, if you look at this uh, computer aided proof of uh, Cashin and Hoffman, in some sense, uh, the fact that they already got to the length 17 is fairly remarkable because, as I said, uh, they kind of had to, in some sense, do a partial Im implementation of this algorithm. Uh, and this algorithm is extremely inefficient. Uh, so uh, you very quickly run into some uh, um, computational complexity problems. And as I said, this algorithm, as far as I can tell, it's actually super exponential in complexity. I haven't thought about the, the actual complexity, but it is. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's quite slow. So uh, uh, the original motivation of Daron Puder when he introduced this notion uh, uh, came from a very different source. Uh, even though I think that this conjecture is very interested, interesting, uh, uh, Puder was thinking about something else. He was thinking about finite groups. And it turned out that in his work, you know, uh, the primitivity uh, 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 rank and this critical set, they came up in the study of so-called uh, uh, word measures on finite symmetric groups. So let me uh, explain what that is. So uh, we take an element W in this free group on X1, XR, and this is a word in the, uh, in the generators X1, XR. So we can think about this W as a map uh, from uh, uh, a product of R copies of the symmetric group to itself, where uh, you just plug in some entries, uh, you know, from these groups, elements G1, GR, evaluate the word W on, on it and get a new element. In fact, W defines a map from uh, the R's power of any group G to itself in this way, but uh, uh, so uh, Puder and later Puder with his coursers, they were particularly interested for various reasons in what happens with finite symmetric groups. And we also get uh, uh, the word measure and uh, mu W defined by W, uh, uh, which is the image of the uh, um, uniform probability measure uh, over here under this map. So basically it's when you plug in sort of a random element, uniformly random element from the first uh, into the first factor into the second factor in, into the R's factor. And what you get will be a random element with respect to this uh, word measure. 
so uh, the image of uh, several random permutations and uh, 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 they were interested in counting the number of fixed points of this kind of a, a random permutation and estimating uh, you know what happens with that uh, uh, in the case where uh, uh, sigma was chosen random with respect to this uh, 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 measure mu w and i'll say more about this later uh, uh, so but that was the uh, original motivation and uh, we'll see later on that uh, this quantities turn out to be relevant then so the main result for today uh, so is the serum uh, uh, from this preprint uh, you know so which is now to appear in the general group series and it says the following that if you fix a number r at least two and take the free group of rank r then there exists an exponentially generic subset i'll denote it by y r and i'll explain what exponentially generic uh, means uh, uh, later uh, such that for every element in this exponentially generic subset the primitivity rank is equal to r which is the maximal possible if you remember and the critical set uh, consists just of the uh, ambient free group f r it's Itself. So the critical set, uh, set consists uh, of a single element. So that turns out to be uh, a sort of generic case behavior. So for quote a random element in this free group, uh, which is sort of what this exponentially generic means, uh, the primitivity rank is the maximal possible, uh, well, except for infinity. So it's equal to R, and the critical set just consists of the ambient free group itself. Uh, so uh let me make uh, several uh, important remarks uh, is that uh, the first conclusion of this theorem that for a, a random element um of the free group the primitivity rank is equal to r was already known it was proved by puder in one of his recent papers uh, from about three years ago or something uh, you know by uh, uh, very different methods. Uh, I don't think he didn't say that it was exponentially generic, but I believe it follows from his methods. On the other hand, his methods don't, don't imply anything about uh, the structure of the critical set for these random elements. So that's sort of the, the really new part. And also a, a, a new and different proof we get uh, of this statement over here. And another interesting feature of this result, which I didn't put in the result itself, although I could have, is that, uh, the subset of YR, the exponentially generic subset uh, YR in the free group uh, that uh, one gets here, one can ch choose it to be algorithmically recognizable. That is to say, you know, I could have strengthened the theorem uh, to, to say that there exists uh, an algorithmically recognizable exponentially generic subset such that these conditions uh, hold. Uh, that is to say, there is an actual algorithm in fact, I believe a polynomial time algorithm which decides whether or not an arbitrary element of the free group belongs to this um, YR. So uh, this bit here is pretty strange because usually we don't think about random subsets uh, uh, as being in any way algorithmic, but this set is, is sort of sufficiently big that even though it's random, it's actually algorithmic, you know, so this is also pretty strange. So, uh, and corollary uh, uh, of this result uh, is that, uh, once again, if we take this free group of rank at least two and take this YR, uh, this exponentially generic uh, uh, subset from the theorem, uh, and then uh, for every element W from this set, the expected number of fixed point of a random permutation uh, sigma with respect to, uh, you know, in uh, in the symmetric group SN uh, with respect to the word measure uh, mu w, which I explained before. Uh, so it behaves like that. So it's one plus uh, one over n to the power m r minus one. And the error term here is big O of uh, one over uh, n to the r. So uh, there is pretty precise asymptotics uh, for the number of fixed points of this kind of a random permutation corresponding on SN uh, in SN uh, corresponding to this. Uh, 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 word measure defined by W. So, uh, of course, the proof of this corollary, you know, I'm teaching here, you know, so I'm using the results of Puder or rather uh, of Puder and uh, Parzanchevsky. So, who proved in 2015 that for any non trivial element in the free group, the number, uh, uh, the expected number of fixed points for this kind of random permutation with respect to the word measure is equal to that, this one plus the cardinality of the critical set divided by n to the power of. Uh, pi of w minus one uh, plus big o 
one over n to the power uh, pi of w and in our case we know that pi of w is equal to r so we get here uh, r minus one and the critical set uh, uh, consists of a single subgroup so the cardinality of the critical set is equal to one uh, that's why we get uh, uh -huh, one over here you know and uh, so that's the conclusion uh, uh, that we get from uh, uh, combining the, the, these things as the precise asymptotics um, uh, for the number of uh, expected fixed points of uh, uh, a random permutation uh, corresponding to the god matter of a generic element. So uh, um, let me now say something about genericity. Uh, uh, so if we have a, a subset S in the free group, which for this talk S will just be equal to the free group uh, in our applications, but in various other situations, one can consider other subsets S. Um, which is smaller so then a subset z inside of s is called exponentially generic if this ratio goes to one uh, exponentially faster then goes to infinity so what's this ratio so we take the number of elements in z of uh, uh, lengths uh, less than or equal than n uh, divided by the number of elements in this ambient set s uh, of lengths less than or equal than n and this fraction has to go to one exponentially fast so that makes z exponentially generic in s as I said, you know, think about uh, the case of fr equals s, but uh, uh, so that's enough to sort of uh, for this talk. But I should also say now that uh, the conclusions of this theorem, uh, you know, so uh, the, the reversions of them were instead of uh, the m band set being the free group, we considered the, uh, for the m band set s to be a set of all cyclically reduced verbs uh, in the free group. And then there is a similar result there. So we can think about this theorem as saying that uh, a random freely reduced uh, 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 element in the free group has this property or a random cyclically reduced element uh, in the free group has uh, this property that uh, the primitivity rank is equal to R and the critical set is just equal to FR. So uh, as far as the notion of genericity is concerned, uh, uh, so as I said, uh, uh, for the purposes of today's talk, it's enough to think about the uh, set S as being the ambient free group FR in which uh, balls grow basically exponentially like two, to, two R minus one to the power N. So that's kind of how the denominator grows, you know, so, and there is even a precise formula, which I'm not going to write. And uh, this property then is better understood in terms of the complement of the set Z. So let me uh, write it here. Uh, so a uh, set Z in FR is exponentially generic if its complement is exponentially negligible. Uh, so Z prime meaning that uh, the number of elements of length N or the number of elements of length less than or equal than N, it doesn't matter what I write here, divided by two R minus one to the power N is if this fraction goes to zero now exponentially fast as N goes to infinity. So you can think about exponentially generic subsets of the free group uh, as the ones you know, which are given by, you know, by this definition. So that's good enough. So, uh, let me uh, uh, give some examples uh, of exponentially generic sets. Uh, 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 uh. So, uh, for instance, the set of all elements in the free group of rank at least two that are not proper powers. Uh, so that's exponentially generic. Or if you like its complement, the set of elements which have proper powers, so that's exponentially negligible. So this is known, it's not very hard to prove, but uh, I'm not going to explain why. So uh, another example comes sort of uh, already from the law of large numbers and a little bit of small deviation theory. So from thinking the elements of free groups in terms of some sort of Markov chain. So uh, if you take, uh, let's say, for simplicity, the free group of rank two, uh, um, you know, so uh, for the, the free group of rank two, uh, this is the free group on A and B. And for every element W, uh, uh, so in this free group, uh, uh, we can denote by W. Uh, a, the number of all occurrences of letters A and A inverses in W. So uh, you can think that if W is a random word of length N, then roughly half of the letters in it will be A and A inverse and roughly half of the letters uh, will be B and B inverse. And that's actually true. So it turns out that if you take the set of all W in 
I should have written here two. Uh, where W A divided by N is close to one half, W A divided by N minus one half is less than epsilon and the absolute value where epsilon is any fixed uh, uh, in advance positive number, then this set is exponentially generic uh, in, in F2. So uh, that's another example of a generic set. So uh, uh, yet another example, uh, which one should really be thinking about this in terms of cyclically reduced words, but here I'm fitting slightly. So for those of you who know the small cancellation condition, so if you fix a number lambda between zero and one, the set of all uh, um, words in the free group whose cyclically reduced form satisfies the C, satisfies the C prime uh, lambda small cancellation condition. So that's exponentially generic. And uh, for those of you who have not seen the small cancellation condition, uh, you know, so that just means that when we look at the cyclically reduced portion W tilde uh, of uh, this word W, then the, uh, this word W tilde, uh, uh, it should have small overlaps with itself and with all cyclic permutation of itself and of its inverses. So that if you take a, a, word, w, a word V, which occurs in two different ways in W, tilde or some cyclic permutation of W tilde plus minus one, then the length of this um, uh, V is uh, less than or equal than uh, lambda times uh, 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 the length of W tilde. So uh, as I said, you know, so that's uh, sort of the small cancellation condition. If you haven't seen it, uh, you should probably not pay attention. And if you've seen it, uh, then you should be familiar with this property. The only thing I will say here is that I want to think about this property as the property of freely reduced words as a restriction on the cyclically reduced portions. And as I said, it's still true that, uh, uh, so if you fix lambda, then the sort of all freely reduced uh, uh, words whose cyclically reduced part uh, satisfies the C prime uh, uh, lambda small cancellation condition, that's exponentially generic uh, in the free group. So uh, the, all of these examples are still relatively standard and relatively straightforward. So uh, let me give you now a, a, a couple of other properties which are not. Uh, uh, so these are kind of generalized small cancellation conditions or uh, graphical small cancellation conditions, if you like. And uh, they were introduced by Arzhansova and Alshansky, uh, uh, so-called graph non readability conditions. So here, uh, um, uh, uh, let me go through it. So uh, for the first one, we fix some number mu between zero and one. Once again, think about mu as being small, maybe one six or smaller. And we are going to say that uh, the word W is mu readable uh, if uh, uh, there exists, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, a reduced labeled graph uh, uh, gamma, uh, you know, so for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, storing subgroup graphs, uh, you know, so you can replace reduced here by folded, you know, that's what I really mean. Uh, um, I'll explain what uh, what these words mean a, a little uh, later, uh, you know, so if you're not, if you've not seen uh, uh, this kind of terminology. So uh, basically this gamma is a storing subgroup graph, which is folded, such a double you can be read along some path in gamma, you know, so that's what will make it readable in gamma. Uh, the volume of gamma, which is the number of topological edges in, uh, in gamma, should be substantially smaller uh, than the length of W. It's less than or equal than mu times W. And remember mu is some number which is strictly less than one. And the third condition is that, so this is a restriction on the geometry of gamma. So its volume is small compared with the length of W. And the third condition is the restriction on the topology of gamma. Uh, which says that the rank of the fundamental group of gamma, which is known to be free, is less than or equal than R minus one, or strictly less than R, if you like. And this rank of the fundamental group of gamma can be expressed uh, as uh, in terms of um, the number of edges minus the number of vertices plus one. So that's the rank. Uh, and saying that it's less than or equal than R minus one, it can be expressed by this inequality over here. Uh, but uh, for those of you who remember a little bit of topology, you should really think about condition number three is saying that the rank of the fundamental group of gamma is less than or equal than R minus one. So that's what makes a word W readable. So if you can read it uh, in a folded graph uh, of small size and small topology where the rank is smaller than R. 
so labeled graphs, uh, you know, so these are graphs where there are arrows and labels on edges. So there is an, an a, a arrow on every edge and a, a label, which is a letter of our alphabet X1, XR. And folded means that there is no vertex where the two incoming uh, or two in outgoing arrows labeled by the same letter. So this kind of situation is forbidden, you know, so for folded graphs. And um, so if you have a, a graph gamma like that, then along an edge pass, so we can look at the label of this edge pass, which is going to be a word in the free group, you know, so that's what uh, the very first thing refers to. And uh, let me now uh, note that uh, being uh, readable is actually a restrictive condition. So uh, if mu is uh, fixed, so it's some kind of a restrictive condition uh, uh, because uh, 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 even though individually taken individually conditions number two and three are not restrictive at all so uh, but somehow when we take them together they become restrictive uh, 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 so let me explain why that is true so if you take any word w we can always write it on a segment like that you know so there are no obstructions to doing that and the fundamental group of this segment is trivial so it has a rank zero and well zero is going to be less than or equal than r minus one so this uh, third condition is satisfied by this uh, example but the uh, uh, the second condition uh, uh, that uh, the volume of the graph was less than uh, uh, mu times the length of W is not satisfied here because, of course, the volume of this graph, the number of edges in it is actually equal to the length of W, right? You know, so that's how we constructed uh, this. So in uh, this example, with reading uh, W along uh, a segment like that, uh, so the second condition is satisfied, uh, sorry, the third condition is satisfied, but the second condition is not. Uh, and uh, uh, it's also easy to see that uh, by using a different gamma, uh, we can uh, satisfy the um, uh, the second condition uh, instead of the uh, uh, the third. Because if you look uh, in the free group for the free group of rank R at this R rows, right, where th there is a single vertex and there, there is a loop edge for every basis element uh, uh, Xi. So in this graph gamma, we can read any word at all, right? You know, so we can read any word. We can read our arbitrary element W, and the rank of this, uh, uh, sorry, the volume of this graph is equal to R. And if W is sufficiently long, uh, you know, then this is R because it's a constant, like two or three or whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's typically at least for long W will be less than mu times the length of W. So this condition will be satisfied. Uh, uh, over here, but of course the third condition is not right. The third condition said that uh, we are trying to read the word W in a graph with small topology where the rank of the final group of this graph is uh, uh, less than R, uh, less than or equal than R minus one, which is not true here, right? The rank of the final group of this graph is equal to R. So somehow taken individually, uh, conditions number two and three are not restrictive, but taken together they are. Uh, so, and that's uh, a result uh, uh, which I'll state later that uh, 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 if you fix double, if you fix this number mu uh, less than one, then the set of all words uh, which are mu readable is actually negligible, uh, or it's complement the set of all words which are not mu readable is generic or even exponentially generic. So, uh, and uh, one should think about being able to read uh, 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 the word w, uh, word w or a large portion of the of word w in a small uh, graph gamma and small meaning small in terms of topology and in terms of volume constitutes some kind of a pattern, you know, and that's why you should think about the set of all non readable non mu readable words as being random or generic. Uh, there is a companion notion which they introduced in a different paper, or maybe a, a Actually, I think Arzantseva maybe introduced this paper, the second notion, uh, uh, sort of in, in a follow-up paper, where uh, in addition to a number uh, mu, uh, which is a number between zero and one, we also fix an integer l, uh, which is at least two. And now uh, what w is going to be mu comma l readable if uh, uh, there exists a, a, a reduced label graph gamma such that w can be written in, in the, uh, can be read in this gamma. Uh, so that's as before. 
Uh, so this is the same condition as we uh, had over here. Uh, the second condition is also the same as before the volume of gamma uh, is uh, uh, at most mu times the uh, length of W. And the third condition where before we had the condition on the volume, uh, uh, sorry, on the rank of the fundamental group, so the topological condition. So we now replace it by saying that the rank of the fundamental group is less than or equal than L. You know, so L appears here. And in addition to that, gamma should not be what's called the finite cover of that R rows. That is to say, it's the same thing as saying that gamma uh, uh, has at least one vertex of degree, which is smaller than 2R. So gamma has to be small in terms of topology. So it's a fundamental group has rank at most L and it's not a finite cover of, uh, um, uh, of this graph over here, you know, which is what this condition uh, uh, expresses. And once again, it turns out that uh, being mu L readable for fixed mu and L is a, is a rare property and being not mu L readable is generic. So that's what uh, they proved. So uh, uh, here is uh, a quick example with a double cover of the two rows, you know, so this is a graph gamma and in this graph, uh, which has uh, uh, six edges, right? Uh, 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 so, and the rank of the fundamental group of this graph is three. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, you see here that we actually need this condition uh, uh, about the degree of every uh, of some vertex being less than two R, uh, because in this graph this condition is not satisfied. Uh, the uh, um, uh, in this graph exactly because it is a finite cover uh, of this picture, uh, the degree of every vertex is equal to four, which is twice R, and there are no abstractions to read in any word, uh, uh, you know, from this free group in this graph. Uh, so. Uh, um, this assumption here is somehow necessary to uh, make uh, uh, readability in, uh, in a rare condition and non-readability generic. And uh, Arzantsova and Alchansky, or at least a combination of their results, uh, says that um, if we fix uh, numbers mu and lambda, which are between zero and one, and we fix an integer L, uh, at least two, uh, then the following set uh, um, is going to be uh, exponentially generic. So the set um, P lambda mu L, this is going to be a subset of the free group uh, of R, and it consists of all W, such that W is, is not a proper power. Uh, w, or rather the cyclically reduced form of W satisfies the small cancellation condition C prime lambda. And uh, whenever W prime, so the, is a subvert of the cyclically reduced portion of W, which is sufficiently long, uh, which is longer than one half, then this W prime should be not uh, uh, mu readable and not uh, uh, mu L readable. So um, this sounds a little complicated, but basically, uh, um, it says that large, so if you ignore this business about cyclic, re, uh, cyclic reduceness, it sort of says that uh, long subverts of W, uh, long subverts of the cyclic reduced form of W are not mu readable and they're not mu L readable. And uh, a key fact, which comes from the papers of Arzans and uh, says that for any lambda mu and L, this uh, set P, P lambda mu L is exponentially generic. And also, if you think about this definition, and if lambda and mu are chosen, let's say, as rational numbers, you will see that uh, this set is actually algorithmically recognizable. Uh, you know, so, uh, one so you, could just, you could just prove that by looking at the three conditions separately, right? You prove it yes, that's correct. All right. And in fact, it's even uh, algorithmically recognizable in polynomial time because uh, 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 there is the bound on the topology on the fundamental group of the graphs that we consider. So uh, the, the they're combinatorially not very complicated. So, uh, and uh, since we still have some time, let me now, so this is a key fact uh, which we are going to use and let me give you some idea about the proof of the main result. So uh, as a, I want to remind you that the main result said that, uh, um, if you can find it. Uh, Here it is. That there exists an exponentially generic set uh, of elements in the free group uh, uh, where the primitivity rank is equal to R for all elements of that set, and the critical set consists just of the free group itself. Uh, 
So I will only concentrate on this first part of the theorem, but the proof of the second part uses similar ideas. So uh, uh, what um, we are going to do, we are going to use this set, uh, uh, which we just introduced, P uh, lambda mu L for, uh, um, um, for a certain L, uh, uh, a certain lambda, uh, uh, a certain lambda, a certain mu, and a certain L. Uh, and uh, 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 the choice of these numbers, um, you know, I'll specify later. So we'll take W from P lambda mu and L, where I'll tell you what lambda mu and L are a little later, but they're fixed in advance. You know, I'll uh, sort of just the proof will tell us, the, you know, how to how to choose them. And I think L is equal to R, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe R minus one, and lambda and mu have to be uh, chosen uh, sort of according to a certain argument. Uh, so uh, um, this definition uh, was a little fussy because there was this uh, uh, business about the difference between W and the cyclically reduced portion of W. So for uh, reasons of simplicity, let me assume that W, uh, the word W that we are looking at is already cyclically reduced. So it turns out not to be sort of a big difference between considering freely reduced words and cyclically reduced words. So let me not sort of concentrate on that. And uh, so we take this uh, W from the set, which we know is generic, where Jans and Elchansky. And we want to now prove that, you know, if we picked lambda mu and L correctly, then this W is going to have pi of W equal to R. So uh, we take W uh, from this set, uh, and then we take H, a subgroup of the smallest possible rank, uh, which contains W as a non primitive element. So, and for those of you who know something about three groups, so you know that uh, all subgroups, they can be represented by Stalling subgroup graphs, you know, so I take here this Stalling subgroup graph, which is a labeled graph, uh, labeled uh, uh, reduced or folded graph in the sense that we discussed, in which W can be read uh, um, uh, 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 because W belongs to H, so W can be read uh, uh, along some closed path from the base vertex to itself. And this uh, uh, this graph represents uh, uh, the subgroup H in the sense that if you look at the set of labels of all closed loops uh, from the base point to itself, so then uh, uh, the set of group elements that you get is exactly H. So, and... Uh, um, as I said, we take H to be of the smallest possible rank. So the rank of H realizes the primitivity rank of W. So this is uh, our assumption. And uh, now um, we are going to assume that uh, the, uh, by arguing by contradiction, that the primitivity rank of W is actually uh, not equal to R. Uh, and that, that is to say that it's smaller than R. And then we'll try to get a contradiction. So remember the rank, uh, uh, so the, uh, in this case, the fundamental group of gamma is isomorphic to H. So the rank of the fundamental group is equal to the rank of H uh, and it's equal to the uh, uh, primitivity rank of W. Uh, so it's some number which is, uh, uh, well, they assume here is smaller than R. And here is some picture of gamma. So it's some uh, reduced label graph. So there is a base vertex and every gamma like that, it has a bunch of maximal arcs. So maximal arcs are uh, connected components of what you get by removing from gamma vertices of degree greater than or equal than three together with the, the base vertex itself. So you will get a bunch of arcs left over. So when you uh, sort of cut this graph along uh, essential vertices and along the base vertex and the topological assumption that the fundamental group of gamma uh, had a rank uh, um, uh, which was less than R, meaning less than or equal than uh, R minus one, implies that this gamma has at most three times R minus one maximal arcs like that. You know, so maximal arcs here that combinatorially we can count them. It's probably an overcount, but it will be enough for us. And as I said, gamma uh, can be read uh, in, uh, uh, as the label of some closed path from the base vertex to itself in this gamma. Mm. So for uh, technical reasons, we make, so this is this red pass gamma, uh, a little gamma, and we take the subgroup gamma zero, which is uh, the sort of the red subgraph. So it's the subgraph uh, of this graph gamma, which is spanned by this, uh, by this pass along which we read W. Uh, 
And there are two possible cases that can happen here is that uh, in gamma zero, uh, uh, this closed path, uh, you know, gamma, it traverses some maximal arc exactly once. And the second case is that every maximal arc in gamma zero is traversed at least twice. So the first case is in, if in this red graph, at least one of the maximal arc uh, arcs is traversed by uh, uh, by this pass a little gamma uh, by this pass gamma at exactly once uh, means by some sort of fairly simple uh, uh, topological argument that uh, uh, that gamma is actually a primitive element in the fundamental group of gamma zero and from here because gamma zero was a subgroup of gamma, of gamma it follows that gamma was a primitive in the fundamental group of the ambient graph gamma and from here by the isomorphism between various things that we have here, it follows the W was a primitive element in the subgroup H, uh, which this graph gamma represents. But that uh, uh, contradicted our choice of gamma, right? Because we chose uh, 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 H to be such that uh, it is it contains W as a non-primitive element and as the subgroup of the smallest possible rank that contains W uh, as a non-primitive element. So th this situation where uh, this red path crosses some maximal arc exactly once uh, contradicts uh, this assumption over here that W was non-primitive in H. Therefore, we are in the second pass, in the second case, sorry, where uh, um, uh, gamma traverses uh, every maximal arc of gamma zero at least twice. And now we come to the fact that uh, 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 our word, uh, which we now assume was cyclically reduced, uh, satisfies the C prime lambda small cancellation condition. And uh, what that means is that uh, if this word W traverses a maximal arc uh, in some way uh, at least twice, it means that the length of this arc or the length of the label of this arc, which is the same, is less than or equal than lambda times the length of W. That's the definition of the small cancellation condition. So that tells us that in gamma zero, every maximal arc uh, has lengths less than or equal than lambda times uh, the length of W. The number of arcs was less than or equal than three times R minus one. So that gives us uh, the bound uh, on the total volume of gamma zero is uh, less than or equal than three times R minus one times lambda times the length of W. And by now uh, playing uh, with uh, uh, lambda and mu, we can make uh, this number over here. Uh, we can choose lambda and mu. We can make lambda very, very small. Uh, we can first, first pick mu and then we pick lambda uh, and we can make this number smaller than mu so that this inequality is going to hold. So we can arrange for uh, uh, three times r minus one times lambda uh, to be less than mu. Uh, and uh, this actually means that uh, the word w is mu readable, right? So here we didn't even need l. This l is needed for the second part of the theorem where uh, we deal with the critical set. Uh, uh, so, and um, well, we can think about l as being r or something, or it doesn't matter what it is, you know, in this argument. And uh, this contradicts. Uh, um, uh, our assumption that W uh, was uh, an element of this set because elements of the, uh, for elements W in this set, not only is W not mu readable, but even large portions of W are not mu readable. So this is a contradiction. Uh, and uh, so the proof that the critical set consists uh, only of the ambient free group itself. So over there, one actually needs L. I, I believe it's either R or R minus one. I forgot what it is, uh, you know, so in the actual argument, but you can look it up in the paper. But the flavor of the argument is very similar. So I'll, I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> so that's the sort of the sketch of the proof uh, uh, of the first part of the theorem. So you now have a pretty good idea about what's going on there. Let me now mention a few other things uh, that the main result uh, can be uh, about the fact that exponentially generic elements in the free group have primitivity rank equal to R and the critical set consisting of FR only can also be reinterpreted in terms of random works. So we can think about uh, uh, an element of the free group is generated by what's called a simple non backtracking random walk of length n, where this w, you know, which is a, a word uh, uh, of length n, uh, 
we basically pick uh, its first letter uh, at random, uniformly at random among the letters X1, XR, and the inverses. So that's the first letter of W. After that, uh, we pick the second letter to be uh, uh, uniformly at random at the two R minus one uh, letters, uh, you know, among X1, XR, and the inverses, which are not inverses of the first letter that we already chose. Then after we pick the second letter, we pick the third letter to be sort of at random so that it's not the inverse of the previous letter and so on. And this kind of a process generates what's called a simple non-backtracking random work uh, uh, on the free group. And if we do it n times, uh, then the distribution on the n sphere that we get is actually going to be precisely the uniform distribution. So uh, every word W of length n under this process is just as likely to occur as every other word. So since it gives us the uniform distribution, as I said, is the counting measure on the sphere, you know, so that uh, um, basically allows us to reinterpret uh, uh, the main result as saying that this probability tangent to one uh, as n goes to infinity for the word W uh, of length n generated by a simple random, uh, by this simple non backtracking random walk of length n, uh, the primitivity uh, rank of Wn is equal to R and the critical set of Wn is equal to uh, uh, consists just of the ambient free group FR. That, uh, that this event over here, it happens uh, with probability tangent to one uh, as n tends to infinity. And in fact, even uh, the convergence of this probability to one is exponentially fast. So that's another uh, actually, interesting and important way of thinking about this result, which brings us to a question about what happens if instead of this kind of random work, one considers other types of random works on the free group. So for instance, we just can consider a simple random work uh, or a simple non backtracking random work uh, corresponding to some other kind of generating set of the free group, not the free basis here, but some other generating set. So we just pick some elements V1, Vt, well, in, uh, so T is greater than or equal than R necessarily. Uh, so some elements which generate this free group, and then we generate a random element Wn by picking G1 to be uh, uniformly at random an element uh, among V1 plus minus one, V2 plus minus one, Vt plus minus one. And then after that, we pick G2 in the same way, uh, Gn also in the same way. And then we just multiply them and we get this kind of uh, a random element. So that's just a random work. It gives us a word of length n uh, in the free group, which will not necessarily be uh, Free reduce, but we can free reduce it. And then it is legit legitimate to ask what can be said probabilistically about the primitivity rank and the critical set of this kind of element. And the answer is at the moment we have no idea, but at least this question can sort of, one can attempt, um, even though with difficulty to, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, to simulate this question, uh, 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 experimentally because we can easily generate this kind of a random element uh, and then uh, very fine uh, conjecturally you know we should have the same kind of behavior uh, so that already requires some work but i think you know it can be done or at least you know one can attempt to do it so the conjectural behavior here is that for random works uh, you know of more general kind you know the ones which i just described or even more general ones where the probabilities on this uh, generators v1 through vt are not the same so we just assign them some probabilities uh, to, to these generators and the inverses which add up to one and then we uh, generate uh, this random element wn uh, according to the choice of probability for each letter you know so uh, conjecture i believe the same conclusion should be true but for the moment uh, uh, there is no proof of that and somehow neither the argument that i showed you nor the arguments of the wrong pudder go through so uh, i believe that the conclusion of the theorem should be uh, true but it requires uh, new arguments uh, you know so one has to uh, do something else so and um, i wanted to say something about a dual notion, the notion of uh, uh, um, primitivity index, but I see that uh, I'm out of time. So I'll just stop here. That will be all. Thank you very much. All right. So since um, Olga is silent. Any questions? Uh, yes. Okay. So the uh, 
I, I think I missed one point. So you, you said that the number of maximal arcs is the most three times R minus one. I missed where that came from. Uh, it's just some fairly simple combinatorial argument. Uh, um, I mean, it comes from the bound on the on the rank of the uh, um, group of the fundamental group. Because remember, uh, we assume here that the uh, gamma pi one of gamma has uh, uh, has rank, you know, which is the rank of H, which is less than or equal than R minus one. Oh, it comes from oh, that. Oh, oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So it's just a graph of bounded uh, topology, and you right, can right, count. Right. Right. So, and it's some kind of a naive. You can do better. I mean, this three times r minus one is like a very rough overkill. You know, so I don't remember what the actual optimal bound is, but uh, you know, so I can, I can do it. But it comes uh, from from there. Other questions? Hmm. All right, well, if there are no other questions, thank you very much. Ilya, is it like it's, is the paper in the archive? Uh, yes, yeah, it's in the archive. It may already even, well, I don't remember actually, maybe the journal already posted uh, some electronic version, but it's definitely it's in, in the archive, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. from uh, September or something like this of last year, I don't remember the date. Uh, uh, oh, just one yeah. Uh, uh, so here, here is the uh, the number of that preprint. Yeah. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Okay, in this journal of bacteria. All right. So, um, if there are no other questions, let me stop the recording.